Today on the newscast, we are in Galilee with the one and only Amir Sarfati of Behold Israel, who breaks down all the latest news from here in the Middle East, what the Bible says about it, and how it affects you no matter where you live. That's next. Hey folks, Eric Stackelbeck here. Welcome to the Watchman Newscast and welcome to Galilee. The Jordan River is just below me here. The Sea of Galilee is just a stone's throw away. And that is where I caught up with our good friend, Amir Sarfati of Behold Israel for a wide ranging interview. As Amir broke down everything happening in the region right now, whether it's Iran, Russia, the earthquake in Turkey, the ramifications of that, the crazy political scene in Israel right now. And he also shared some of his personal testimony, which I think you'll love. Now, before we get into the interview, remember, subscribe to Amir's channel right here on YouTube. It is called Behold Israel, at Behold Israel. He's also got a great Telegram channel. He's written many best-selling books. He is a prolific author. He's a good friend of the show. Let's go to our interview with Amir right now at the Setai Hotel on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Take a look. Number one, just thinking of hot topics right now in the region, you're on top of all of it at Behold Israel, the earthquake in Turkey. Uh, as you and I are sitting here talking, over 40,000 people are dead, and Amir, those numbers will probably increase. What is your take now as the cleanup continues and the relief efforts continue, which Israel has been involved in, by the way, Israel sent rescue teams. What is your take on the larger ramifications for the region in the wake of that earthquake? Mm. Well, first of all, Israel was one of the first countries to offer help and one of the first, second to Azerbaijan only, to arrive at the scene and second to Azerbaijan only in the, in the size of the delegation. We had over 400 people, whereas anything below that was 200 and less. And so Azerbaijanis had more, but Israel number two, it's not bad for a country that is different in religion, yeah. different in their geopolitics, and certainly someone that was a bit uh, far from you for the last few years. Erdogan. Exactly. The very early hours of the morning when I heard about the earthquake, one of the first thing that went through my mind is how in the world Iran is going to try and benefit from it. And sure enough, within less than 24 hours, I found out. Two things. Now Iran can have the license to have cargo planes landing in Syria when the international community would not look at it as something suspicious. Only Israel will. <laughs> now Iran it has amnesty. It's, it's like we can actually fly as many flights as we want to wherever we want, all under the guise of humanitarian help. And the world will understand. If Israel, God forbid, will attack one of those flights, we are those that are destroying the humanitarian relief aid to, to the Syrians. That's number one. The Saudi and the Emirati planes that unloaded very expensive, high quality relief uh, equipment and medications and food, all of this is now being taken by the leader, the commander of the 4th Division, Maher al-Assad, uh, President Assad's brother, and he collaborates with the Iranian proxies. And he takes everything and basically the clothes, the food, and the medications is not going to those that are affected, but to the Iranian proxies. So, so not only that they're not helping, they're actually stealing the other help that is coming from legitimate uh, It's pure evil, Amir. And Israel, by the way, is aware of this. They've actually warned the Iranian regime not to yeah. take advantage of the situation, but Iran will continue to push there. Hey, you mentioned Iran's proxies, and in a minute I want to ask you also about the prophetic implications of earthquakes. But before we get that, Amir, real quick, Iran's proxies, that ring of fire that surrounds Israel right now, how successful has Iran been in transporting advanced weapons to those proxies. I'm thinking in particular of precision guided missiles, PGMs and, and Hezbollah. Has Iran had success in that or has Israel been successful in blunting those efforts by the Iranian regime? Well, you know, Israel has been successful in destroying a lot, but let's say for every 10 attempts, if we destroy eight, two are successful. 
So if you gather that, and they have one thing about the, the, the Iranians that they have patience, and they've, and, and they've got time. They, they, they understand that time works for us. Governments in Israel can change. We're still in power. Yeah. The whole area can change. We're still in power. And so they, they do what they know how to do best, which is deceive the world. I believe that the, in light of what we see in, in Ukraine, uh, one of the biggest problems that Israel will have is uh, suicide drones that the Iranians are, are sending in parts all the way to Syria. Some of them are to be smuggled into Lebanon for Hezbollah. And even though as far south as the Houthis Abs in Yemen? Absolutely. The, look, the Houthis is a different story where they do where, whatever they want. Yeah. The Houthis, by the way, I think can become a big headache for Israel if they decide to do something simultaneously with the Hezbollah from the north yeah. and the proxies from the northeast. But I will tell you that um, Israel has been very successful, but um, we are, it's only because we have very good human intelligence on the ground. And if it was not for that, we, we would have been in big problem. There's a lot of people in Abul Kamal and in, in, in other uh, towns on, along the border that are on the payroll of the Israeli intelligence yeah. services. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, we, not only that we know what they're smuggling, but we know if there is a convoy of 10 trucks, we know which truck. We've and seen that. You've seen that. Along the Iraq-Syria exactly. border, Israel recently hitting some of those convoys. Yes. And like that's not said. the first time. It's yeah. it, well, probably the third or the fourth where we strike precisely a specific truck where we know that's where the weapon was. Yeah. And so that tells you a high level of intelligence on the ground. The same goes with what just happened in Isfahan. As you know, Israel managed to smuggle parts of drones. They were assembled in Erbil area and they were then brought all the way to uh, fly low below the radar but that's where people don't know what happened next. Those drones landed on the roof, drilled a hole, and then lowered through two holes explosive that destroyed one device in the size of two washing machines. And that one device is a crucial component for the conversion of the gas into the element that they can use for a nuclear weapon. So <laughs> we know exactly the device, where it is exactly in the building, and how exactly to get there without to blow up the whole building. The building, by the way, is still standing, but there's a few holes in the roof, that's all. Wow. <laughs> it's quite amazing, and that's human yeah, intelligence. That is, and Amir, I have not seen that reported anywhere else, folks. You have to follow Amir on his Telegram channel and at Behold Israel on YouTube. We're gonna talk about your books as well. Yeah. But this is kind of reporting you are not hearing anywhere else, and that's what Amir is bringing you on a daily basis. Number two, my friend, one of the things we love about your reporting, your analysis, your commentary, is you're doing it from a biblical perspective. You're not just reporting the news, you're, you're asking and you're telling us what the Bible says about it, which brings us back to the earthquakes real quick, Amir. The Bible seems to, not only seems to, it flat out says that more is coming, more seismic activity. Israel is actually due for a major earthquake. What does the Bible tell us about what's coming in yeah. terms of earthquakes in this region and around the world? Well, factually, every 100 years there's a biggie here in this area. The last one was in, uh, in 1927. So we have five or four more years to complete the 100 for the big one. Um, but yes, everybody is talking about earthquake. That is a big possibility in Israel. Um, and again, one of the major reasons there were so many casualties in Turkey right now, and a lot of people don't know, um, is the fact that a lot of illegal construction with cheap materials done by very criminals, basically, yeah. Um, and, and that's what caused these, these buildings to, to fall like a stack of cards. By the way, they found, in, very close to the epicenter, they found a whole town where not a single building collapsed. And they, they came and they asked, what's going on? Apparently, the ticket for which the mayor ran was, I'm not allowing illegal construction. That was his ticket. 
Nothing was built illegally. All the buildings are still standing. Think about if everybody were following the regulations and the rules and the code, the building codes, how many lives could have been spared uh, in that region? The seismic activity is increasing in intensity. Correct. And, and the frequency. Uh, and frequency, Which yes. Which brings us to what the Bible says, yeah. that what we are going to watch is like birth pangs. Yes. And what birth pangs are all, I mean, we never gave birth, <laughs> but we have wives that gave birth, mm -hmm. and we know exactly, everyone knows, birth pangs are not just simple pains. They are prior to the birth, and they are intensifying in their frequency and their intensity. I mean, we're talking about more and more and more painful and more painful. And what we see now, we've never seen so many earthquakes in history in such a short time. And we've never seen them that strong. So this is as far as that. You've written so much and spoke so much about the War of Gog and Magog. Correct. There will be a major earthquake there according to the prophet yes. Ezekiel. You've got a great book called Revealing Revelation. Mm -hmm. And look, the day of the Lord and in the last days, some of the greatest earthquakes in human history uh, yeah. will hit this planet. Absolutely. Look, I see biblically two earthquakes that are, one is going to shake Israel, one is going to shake the whole world. They are future events. The one you just spoke about is part of how God will win for us uh, in, in the uh, Gog, uh, uh, in Magog War of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And the last one was at the very end of the tribulation, an earthquake in the size and the, and the intensity that has never been seen since the world was made. So we're, we're talking about, you know, I, I've watched some videos of how, how the earth shifted um, and how it moved during the earthquake. It's, it's quite scary to see that. I mean, literally, you see things move like that. Okay. If that's only 7.8, think about the biggie that is going to happen. Beyond 10 on it's, the Richter scale. It, yes, it's, 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 it's just... So people need to understand, yeah. we are watching right now birth banks and wake-up calls. Mm -hmm. These wake-up calls are in three levels. The level of wars, the level of pandemics, and the level of earthquakes. All three were mentioned by Jesus yeah. when he described what the end time will look like but then he said but don't be afraid the end is not yet it's it's like it has to happen these yeah. things must happen but don't be afraid right. so for the christian for the believer this is not a, a, a reason to be afraid it's a reason to understand okay that's the sign yeah. it's exactly what the people asked the disciples asked, tell us the sign right. and he gave them the sign but he didn't say when you see that i want you to be afraid no when you see that don't be afraid because these things must happen. By the way, every time Jesus says must happen means he knows it happened. You know, prophetically, it, it already happened, but we haven't seen it yet. Same goes with all the events of the book of Revelation. These are things that John was uh, receiving a revelation of, but these things happen, it's just that we haven't experienced them yet. Yeah. It's not like we can change some of the events of Revelation. No, we can't. Yeah. It happened. They must happen because, yeah. in the mind and in the you know realm of God, they happen. He's got. He's reporting to us what is going. To, that's that's the phrase. Mm -hmm. Must happen. You mentioned the war of Gog and Magog. Russia, obviously, a major player in that Amir and making major moves right now. I want to ask you about that in a minute. But real quick, we're talking earthquakes. We have a. I guess you would say a geopolitical earthquake in recent months here in Israel. Mm -hmm. We've got the new government, obviously, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu back at the helm. We've got this judiciary overhaul, people taking to the streets and protesting. What's your take, as someone who lives here in Israel, yeah. what's your take on everything going on right now politically? And is the Netanyahu government dangerous, as some of its critics are suggesting? It's funny because all the critics are saying that's the end of democracy, yeah. but they don't want to hear any other opinion. <laughs> if you're so democratic, why don't you allow others to talk also? No, it's my opinion or nothing. Now, find me one country on planet Earth where the judges appoint themselves. There's no such thing. In America, how do you appoint, how do you appoint Supreme Court judges? 
the president. President appoints them and Congress has to approve them. That's right. Okay, which means the executive and the, and the legislative branch that are elected mm -hmm. are the ones to choose the judiciary branch. And there's hearings and it hearings. gets nasty. Exactly. Yeah. I've seen all of them you know, t during the, the time of Trump. Kavanaugh and, and, and the others. Now, here in Israel, it used to be like that. Something happened and throughout the course of the years, the committee that is choosing and electing judges became more populated with judges and lawyers, who by the way are in bed with the judges because they meet every day in court. And less, the, the justice minister in Israel is actually the minority. The one that people voted for to run the system is the minority. He cannot, and by the way, whether it's the right wing that is in power or the left wing in power, but it happens to be that the left grabbed a hold of that system and won't release because right now, this is it. It's a powerhouse that they won't let go of. Now, that is the problem in Israel. We've got a system that is an exclusive club, a point itself, and nobody can touch them. And they can disqualify laws that were legislated by the, judici the, uh, the uh, legislative branch. They can interpret however they want because there is a new thing. It doesn't look reasonable. Well, reasonable in your eyes. Maybe it's reasonable in the eyes of three million people that voted for. I mean, reasonable. What is reasonable? Yeah. So we're trying to fix things that, by the way, were not like that and turn into what we see now in the last 30 years. It's not like somebody is trying to destroy democracy. Somebody is trying to restore what was there before democracy was destroyed. But the left, as always, has two ways of dealing with things. One, chaos in the streets, and two, sowing fear. What we have is a very radical group of, of people that is inciting 80 to 100,000 people. that are the same people. Some of them are getting paid to go and demonstrate, by the way. And all of them are being funded by organizations outside of Israel, from the European Union, some from the Americans, just so you know, all of that in order to create chaos and in order to take Netanyahu down. They try to take him down with a, a trial that every day that passes is a farce. They couldn't do that. They tried to make him look bad in the eyes of the Israelis. It didn't work. And now they're trying to bring him down as a danger to the democracy. You know, in the world, two hops in this, Amir, as you know, the U.S., Europe actually released a joint, the U.S. and some European nations released a joint statement recently condemning an Israeli announcement that they'll build in Judea and Samaria the biblical heartland. They condemned Israel faster than they condemned Iran. That's right. Faster than they condemned Russia. It's funny how fast when it comes to the Palestinians. In the midst of a terror wave. Terror wave. In the yeah. midst of a terror wave. In the midst of a, a war all around the world, in the midst of Iranian collaboration with Russia to bring devastation to a European country, all of that, and they find time to condemn Israel. By the way, they'll condemn us whether we build or not. Yeah. Look at the decisions of the UN Security Council, UN Human, Human Rights Organization. It's always the same. So, so we say, if they condemn us anyway, why don't we build? <laughs> Just build. Yes. And it's a response to it's terror, Absolutely. Too. You're not going to push us off absolutely. our ancestral homeland. Yes. We will stay here. This is our ancestral homeland. strengthen our presence. Yes. These are, by the way, not new settlements. They are, these are settlements that are there. It's just that we now make them legal. <laughs> so the world is getting crazy. Yeah. Legal for the Jews to live in Samaria? Are you out of your mind? They are, yeah. They're more angry about that than what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on in Iran. Yeah. How fast do they condemn what, what the Iranian regime is doing to the Iranian people? Not too fast. No. But here, oh, yeah. let's do it fast. That yeah. tells you the hypocrisy, but that tells you also that it's demonic. Yeah. There is a spiritual element here. One of the things that people don't know, Eric, is that when God promised, there was a promise to Abraham, he promised Abraham to have a seed, land, and then the blessing. 
The blessing cannot come unless the seed is in his land. Every time there was a curse, we were out of our land. And every time he wanted to restore us, he brought us back to our land. So the return of the Jews back to their land, the restoration of the people back to their promised land, where blessing will follow, is the problem of the enemy. And this is why they don't mind. They, they love to love the Jews. They don't want the Jews to be in their land. Yeah. See, it's demonic. They don't like strong no, Jews. No, no, no. Because Jews in the land, it's too biblical. Yeah. Too good. The blessing will come, God forbid. Because remember, the blessing comes every time God wanted to bless us. He brought us back to the land. Every time he wanted to restore us, he brought us back to the land. That's the, the most amazing event of the last 2,000 years, the return of the Jews to the land. And guess what? On the eve of our return, on the day we declared statehood, did we have any approval uh, or, or, or some peace-loving uh, uh, neighbors around us that danced in the streets? No. We had a devastating had war of tanks five... rolling in. Th that was <laughs> From our every direction. Lands. So I'm saying it's the same as it was 75 years ago. It's the same today. They don't like the Jews back in their land. Yeah. And so now they have a new semantics. Don't be back in the West Bank. But I'm asking you, Eric, when was the PLO established? In 1964. 1964, Israel was not in the West Bank. It was not in Gaza. It didn't have the Golan Heights. And yet it was Palestine Liberation Organization. That's right. And the map is of the entire country. It has nothing to do with Judea and Samaria. It has nothing to do with the Golan or Gaza. It has to do with our very existence in the entire country. You've reported a lot on Russia and Ukraine. What are the latest developments there? Is Vladimir Putin uh, in it for the long haul? Uh, it, he's in the war for the long haul, but is he going to be around for the long haul? Could we see perhaps a different Russian leader when the Gog Magog war does come eventually? Uh, what's your take on what's going on in Russia right now? Will they prevail in Ukraine? Okay, first of all, Biblically, I don't see Ukraine coming against Israel, I see Russia coming yeah. against Israel. So they have to be there for that war. Yeah. So I don't see Russia disappearing or completely de being defeated. But I will tell you this, Vladimir Putin is holding two things against the West right now. Two major things. One, you turn Ukraine into a NATO member even if you don't declare it. You arm Ukraine and N NATO uh, military experts are orchestrating the whole war. Yeah. Second thing is the Nord Stream. Vladimir Putin knows very well who did it. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you that I know who did it, but I will tell you that it was definitely not Russia that did it. Yeah. It was definitely either the UK or the US, and we know that, and they know that we know that. Now, my point is, Vladimir Putin, in, in order to punish the West can take some steps that are very, very extreme. Yeah. The Northern Fleet was just armed with nuclear weapon. First time in 30 years that the submarines and the frigates are all armed with nuclear weapon. First time in 30 years. Never happened since the Cold War. Second, he is considering unification with Belarus. They already have alliance and some sort of a treaty, but unification means Belarus is Russia, which means I can attack now from Belarus because it's Russia. From the north. Yes, from the north. And he's considering that, and we know that there is going to be, I don't know what day we're going to air this program, but on the 22nd of February, there is a special session of the Russian parliament, very unusually special session. We're not sure what he's going to announce there, but something big is going to be. By the way, up until today, he never declared war. This is a special operation, not a war. Special military he operation. Might, yeah. Once you change the definition, you can also change the rules of engagement. And he knows that, and we know that. So if he will turn it into a war, then all means are kosher. Yeah. And he'll, uh, he'll, he'll do stuff that we have not seen before. Yeah, all bets are off. And yep. There continues to be the nuclear saber rattling from Medvedev and other members of yep. his inner circle. Speaking of nuclear saber-rattling, Amir, you've been at the forefront of reporting on the 
shadow war increasingly out of the shadows between Iran and Israel when it comes to Iran's nuclear program. Pretty simple question. Do you see Israel, in particular under this new government, under Bibi, perhaps being forced to take military action to stop Iran's nuclear program? Because the West has not seemed too eager to kind of pitch in and come alongside Israel in that, in a military sense. Well, I, I see that Israel must do that, but I also see that Israel alone cannot do it, uh, you know, uh, by itself. I mean, we, we need help. Uh, we can have, rec you know, some clandestine operations, Mossad operations, reconnaissance operations. We can destroy here something, there yeah. something. But in order to completely destroy the Iranian nuclear, uh, pr when I say nuclear program, I'm not saying the enrichment of uranium. They already have enough. Yeah. To, as of today, they have enough uranium for bombs. That's what we know. The pr now comes the, the money time is how do you convert it into a bomb and how do you take that bomb and what vehicle is going to take it to wherever you want. And this is the crucial part right now because we, you know, we dropped the ball when it comes to uranium enrichment. This is it. They already have it. We don't have much time. The, 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 literally, we have months left should the Ayatollahs decide to push forward for the bomb. Um, unless other countries join us and we, we strike a massive strike simultaneously, other than Mossad operation, I don't think, I, I don't see how we can do things. Wow. And so over the last uh, few months we had unprecedented exercises and drills with the US military. Mm -hmm to tell you that someone in the White House is going to allow that to happen. I'm not sure if this is the right president. I'm not sure, but should there be a more conservative president in the White House that understands exactly what Iran is all about, s such as the 45th, it would have been done. Yeah, that's a game changer, I think, Amir. The current occupant of the White House, Joe Biden, is he really, truly committed to stopping a nuclear Iran like he says he is. I think Biden right now is is not afraid of Russia and super afraid of China Yeah. at this point. That's why if you and I would fly a little tiny paper plane above one of those nuclear bases of America in Montana, we would have been shot down within seconds. Oh, yeah. But a, a Chinese spy balloon can fly for days. That's right. My point is, if you have no problem sabotaging a, a, a pipe for, or, of the Russians, but you have a problem shooting down one balloon of the, of the Chinese, I think you're more afraid of China than Russia. Another thing is, if you have three balloons that you know they're Chinese, but the other, the new three, you call them aliens, yeah. or you UFOs. call them UFOs, excuse me, <laughs> UFOs, then the, I guess that the Chinese are working with aliens. Yeah because you cannot have three that are Chinese and three that are UFOs. Yeah. Let's face it, they're trying to divert the attention from the problem that we have, which is a silent war with China already. The Chinese have breached your sovereignty and airspace repeatedly, and America is not decisively doing something. Yeah, about. and the strange thing is many on the left uh, in the West actually admire that Chinese social credit system yes. and everything China is doing domestically, the repression. They'd love to bring it here. Uh, hey, folks, by the way, we are at the Satai Hotel on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Big thanks to the beautiful Satai Hotel for their hospitality and allowing us to film. Last question, my friend. We've covered all the bases mm -hmm. geopolitically. A lot of people are probably asking, saying, man, this guy is an absolute wealth of knowledge. And wait a minute, he knows the Bible, too? You've got Behold Israel. You've got the great Telegram channel, Revealing Revelation, great best-selling books. How did you come? Condensed version. I know it's a longer testimony. How did you come to do what you do and become a follower of Jesus, mm -hmm. being born and raised in Israel, serving in the IDF? now following Jesus and broadcasting the message of the Lord and a prophetic message around the world. Well, the abbreviated version is that uh, I grew up in foster care because my, my parents, it was a dysfunctional family after they got divorced. I uh, grew up in foster care. Life sucked. It was terrible. I wanted to kill myself. I was uh, that depressed. Um, right at the very low point of my life, I remember I decided to give 
whatever, the world, one last chance. That week, I learned that my best friend from school is a Messianic Jew. I went to his home to study for the final exams of the high school. They, uh, they introduced the, the gospel to me. I didn't truly understand at the time what it's all about. Uh, and what bothered me the most was that every prayer had to end with B'Shem Yeshua in the name of Jesus. But then I remember that uh, I asked, why do you have to do this? I said, well, you need to ask God to show you who Yeshua is because then you will understand why you have to ask in His name. And so I didn't, uh, I mean, I understood everything when, when it comes to what the prophet said, but I didn't truly understand the need for Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I pray that night uh, that God will just show me who Yeshua is. The next morning I found out that there is a, while putting together the newspapers in my workplace before school, I found out that there's the, the Jesus film of Campus Crusade showing in Jerusalem in a regular movie theater. I went to see it uh, because I, w I was presented the whole gospel with Old Testament prophecies popping on the screen. And these prophecies I knew. I never saw the connection until that movie. And then, of course, um, I got saved. Uh, the foster family kicked me out because of my faith a few weeks later. I uh, got baptized not far from uh, Jerusalem in a, basically, here I am next to the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee. I got baptized in a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> and I joined the Israeli military uh, from someone who didn't want to be in the military. I ended up being the deputy governor of Jericho in the Jordan Valley. At the time, we pulled out of Jericho and we handed it over to the Palestinians. I formed the first uh, uh, collaboration and coordination unit between the Israelis and Palestinians in the West Bank, which was Jericho at the time. Um, I studied in the Hebrew University School of Tourism to be a tour guide in Israel. I led tours. I studied ministry in Southern California. And uh, I mean, I, I, I just love connecting world events with Bible prophecy. Yeah. The prophetic part of the Bible, less than 30%, 27%, but yet the most ignored or abused part of the Bible. Yes. And it's very sad. And, and if there is one thing that Jesus rebuked his disciples is foolish ones and slow of heart to believe that which the prophets have said. You see, if they, believe, if they would have believed everything the prophets said, they would have not been sad when the tomb was empty. <laughs> After the tomb was empty on Sunday morning, two of them walked to Emmaus, sad, embarrassed, yeah. confused. The road angry. to Emmaus, yeah. There you go. So only if we understand the prophetic part of the Word of God, we draw so much hope. Uh, and, and even though things are dark all around us, yeah. we have hope. Jesus said, do not be afraid. Do not be alarmed. Do not be troubled. These things must happen. So when we see those things, look up and uh, your redemption is drawing near. That's right. That's the message. Thanks again to our good friend Amir Sarfati for those great insights. Folks, again, Amir's YouTube channel is called Behold Israel. Head on over right now and subscribe at Behold Israel. Also follow him on Telegram. Pick up any of his great books. He is doing fantastic work not only breaking down the geopolitical situation here in the region and how it affects all of us, but tying it all together from a biblical prophetic perspective. And that is what really counts. Hey, it's been great having you with us on this very special episode of the Watchman Newscast from Galilee. God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace. Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the Watchman Newscast. If you enjoyed this episode and want to see more, make sure you go ahead and hit the like button, click subscribe, and tap the bell icon to turn on notifications for new Watchman Newscast episodes every weekday.